Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who is somehow going to tie my review today into Kanye at the end of this video. So stay tuned if you want to see how this album, Sinner Get Ready by Lingua Ignota, is in some ways a perfect companion piece for the upcoming Kanye Sure To Be Masterpiece. I'm reviewing this primarily because a few people have put in comments, Sky, I think you like Lingua Ignota, Sky, I think you should check this out. And usually if people say that, usually it means they know my taste and they know what I like to talk about. And I have to say, uh, on first listen, I was like, damn, I don't think I like this. I'm not sure I get it. This might just sort of annoy me. But as I often do, you know, I take music very seriously and I never just rely on a first impression. I listen to it a little bit more intently. And in particular, I listen to it on headphones as opposed to in a car and it was a totally different experience. This is a very moving, very emotionally harrowing, very piercing album. It's an album that, I'm not gonna say it pierces your soul, because that's a silly thing to say, but it pierces your psyche. It pierces your spirit in some way, where you really get wrapped up with these multiple layers of voices, these instrumentations, these songs about spirituality and God and desperation. And the thing I, I walked away with was thinking it is a unpleasantly pleasant album or a pleasantly unpleasant album, kind of in between those. I'm gonna get into more about how it actually sounds, but what I wanna do is talk a little bit more about the, the general framework of the record. And to do that, I wanna give you a thorough review. Excuse me, I mean a thorough review. You see, I, I think we can see this album in some ways in light of the 19th century American poet, Henry David Thoreau. If you don't know, Thoreau wrote a book in which he went out to Walden Woods in Concord, Mass, Concord, uh, very near where I grew up, and he wrote about the wilderness and about the importance of being amongst nature and about the value of connecting with nature, especially as the world was getting more and more industrial. Much of the world that we can attribute, like a lot of our naturalist thoughts, a lot of environmentalism was really birthed out of his book and out of his thinking and his writing. But at the same time, there's been a backlash, okay? Now, not just the backlash that I experienced growing up in Massachusetts in the 90s where Don Henley and Sting, like every other day, were in town talking about saving Walden Woods. Um, as long as Don Henley wasn't making music, we were safe. Um, but it was like um, Thoreau, even though he was this great hero, this great figure who lived alone in a shack, and he wrote his poetry in the woods so far from Boston and from the industrialized world. He lived right next to a railroad track. I mean, like, the like house railroad track. They were that close. And famously, his mom did his laundry, okay? So this kind of weird contradiction of, you know, was Thoreau just a big phony? And I think the answer is sort of yes and no. Now, what does that all have to do with lingua, uh, lingua Ignota? The conceit behind this album is that she moved to central Pennsylvania. I don't know exactly where. She has a couple central Pennsylvanian landmarks in, throughout this album. But she moved to the Rust Belt, you know? And she just lived there and tried to take in the vibes. In her words, I'm quoting her, I seek but fail to find God in God's own country, in which I find betrayal abandonment, fear and loneliness, judgment. So this is her artist statement, right? And the reason why I, I tie this in with Thoreau is, you know, she's somebody with a very good education, okay? She has a Master's of Fine Arts from Brown, the Ivy League Brown, okay? Like a very, very uh, prestigious, very elite school with a $4.7 billion endowment. It's incomprehensible. Okay, she's classically trained in her voice and I believe in piano as well. And getting her, her thesis or, or her MFA, her Master's of Fine Arts from Brown, she very clearly thinks about art in a very cerebral uh, way, very even academic way, which is maybe why people thought I would relate to it. But then we get to the sort of problem, you know, like what does it mean that she's in this rust belt in God's own country? is the way that she's commenting on it, does it have the same kind of false, uh, I don't know, embedded reporter vibe that Thoreau has, right? According to Wikipedia, she's from Del Mar, okay, in California. And I just, for fun, I looked up the average home <laughs> value in Del Mar. The average home value in Del Mar is $3 million, okay? So 
Let's just deal with this fact, okay? We have a very educated, presumably fairly privileged, uh, coastal elite traveling to an industrial rust belt state to comment on what has happened to people and their faith and their country. Now that I've said all that, and it makes it, I made you think, I'm sorry, if you hear noise down here, my dog Bo is snoring. He does not like these points I'm making. I know, Bo, I'm, I'm sort of making a, a, a condescending point, but I'm getting to a happier place. That happier place is this, you know? So what? So what if she came from privilege and is describing people without privilege? She's not doing it in a condescending way at all. She's not doing a sort of look at that Walmart trash uh, vibe at all. She is using her education. She is using her privilege. She is using her mind to make great art, to make a very interesting, very original, fantastically deep, disturbing, unsettling piece of art. So that's the kind of conflict that I had in listening. The same way that when I read uh, the Walden Pond works by Thoreau, I simultaneously appreciate the writing and appreciate what is done for environmentalism in the entire world. The other part of me is like, yeah, but his mom, I, I believe my wife put it, uh, you can't be a naturalist if uh, you yell at your mom for not ironing your underwear properly. You know, it, like that kind of tension I think is here and I think it needs to be mentioned, but not dwelled upon. So I'm not gonna mention it any further other than that. Musically, so I'm afraid that I am probably not smart enough to fully get this album, okay? She is very clearly classically trained. She's doing things with her voice, doubling, tripling, quadrupling, quintupling, sextupling. Uh, her voice, and, and doing all sorts of harmonies and discordant harmonies and things where I imagine, you know, I live in Rochester, New York. I am positive. <laughs> there's tons of music majors over, over, at, over at Eastman. You know, there's a great music school here. I'm sure that they're just losing it over how good this album is and just so into the, into the, the, the way that this album is constructed. For me, I hear, and being a legitimate French professor, not a legitimate music critic, I just go, oh cool, it's like a neat kind of goth album, okay? Now I say that primarily because it deals with Christianity in a kind of dark, disturbing, neither wholly rejecting nor wholly embracing way that I associate with a lot of goth music, in particular Nick Cave. <clears throat> I imagine Nick Cave would hear this album and say, there's somebody who's doing what I used to be able to do. Vocally, it reminds me a lot of My Mortal Coil, this Mortal Coil? This Mortal Coil, I believe is the name of the band. Um, I never actually owned their albums or got into them, but I was friends with a girl when I lived in Paris uh, who absolutely loved them and all the time. One thing I liked very much is how acoustic and organic the instrumentation is here. It's very much not a 80s throwback or anything. I mean, she says in her artist statement later on, and again, this is somebody who, much like myself, has very clearly <laughs> been uh, in secondary, post-secondary education here. We nod to American primitivism and the American avant-garde, but subvert and explode those forms as well. That sounds like an artist statement, right? Um, so this, the, the primitivism that, that she's talking about, you know, guitar and banjo and piano, and then at times it gets very noisy and very discordant, and it does feel like it's exploding those forms. You know, um, I really think when I'm done with this review, I'm gonna to listen to the album again and then just go, damn it, Sky, you really just, you really just skim the surface of that iceberg. And to that, I say, please leave comments, okay? Please, if you're a fan of this album, please leave comments and tell me why it's even better than I perceive of, okay? Because I, uh, that's one of the greatest compliments I can give to a, a work of art is when I just acknowledge I probably don't get why it's so good, but I believe it based on what I can perceive. It is a very satisfying, enjoyable album, uncomfortably enjoy enjoyable. It's like going to uh, an art exhibit of somebody who makes beautiful art that is designed to make you uncomfortable. Um, musically, it reminds me most of this from the last year, Ethel Kane. I think if you put Ethel Kane and Ligua Ignota next to each other, you'd have a very similar kind of spooky, Midwest, Rust Belt, Middle America, what is God, what is Christ, what is love, sort of all these things mixed together. I think those would be pretty good companion pieces. I did read one comment from somebody on Bandcamp, someone named Sir Preche, 
I don't know how you pronounce her name. And they just said it was utterly effing superb. And for all the 10 minutes that I've been talking here <laughs> about this album, I would say that's probably the simplest way to put it. It is utterly effing superb. Whatever it is that she's doing here, making this music, it is surprising. It is amazing. I'm gonna give you an example, if you don't know. Uh, I give you homework, where I, I tell you to go off, <laughs> I tell you to leave my video and to watch and listen to the music that I'm discussing. In this example, I'm gonna go to Man is Like a Spring Flower. I'll put a link to it up there, right underneath the real banana. Um, and this is a song which is in the middle of the album. It's a great example of that unpleasant and pleasant mixture. It starts off with a quote from one of Jimmy Swaggart's prostitutes. So Jimmy Swaggart was a very prominent televangelist, a preacher on TV, and he made this really fake apology. And it's one of his call girls expressing how that's not the real him. And that's one of the great themes of this whole album is just that people who profess faith don't really have it. Um, musically, this is my favorite song, definitely. It starts off with this banjo and a piano. I suppose that's American primitivism. But then the American avant-garde, she's oddly discordantly harmonious with herself, just singing all, over and over again. The heart of man is, an, is the open gulf. The heart of man is the seventh gate of hell. The heart of man is the crushed horse's tail. What? What does that mean? The heart of man is the crushed horse's tail. The very, right? Is that not a beautiful line that is pleasantly unpleasant? Insane vibrato on her voice. You know, I, I was listening to it with my daughter who's been studying vo uh, voice, and she just goes, ooh, that's some vibrato. <laughs> very good vibrato all the way throughout here. And then the song picks up, right? There's kind of like a banjo and a weird sort of like woodwind sound in the back. It even rhythmically gets a little bit sort of Philip Glassy, kind of this weird rhythm, and the voice is coming in and out. It, there might even be a zither on here, and then it just gets so beautiful, just really, really transcendently beautiful, and she's singing, th this descending voice is going behind her, and she just keeps on singing, love is not enough. It's just, this lead voice is ascending, and then these other voices are going in the back, and I'd say it's probably the best usage of voice on the entire album. And it's also probably the best production on a well-produced album. Bo got too hot in the sun, he's moving to the other room. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the track now, uh, the rest of the album, uh, and kind of give you an example of what it sounds like a little bit quicker. The first track is called The Order of Spiritual Virgins. Every track on this album has some kind of weird, gothy, religious overtones. What I like about this is it has a very uncharacteristic beginning. These keyboard sounds are just like pulsing and dangerous, which actually like echoes her voice a little bit. And then the piano comes up. And as far as I can tell, that's it. That's it for electronic sounds on the whole album. Right off the bat, she lets you know you're gonna have multiple voices, these lines, hide your children, hide your husbands. The vocals just keep on feeling resolved and unresolved. And then the whole thing ends with these crashing sounds like a piano being pushed over on its side and like a reality show sample from like one of those things where they drop people in the woods, you know? It's just the whole thing together is uh, very ambitious and very successfully realized. I Who Bend the Tall Grasses is track two. Very clear voice. This, it's hard even to take her seriously in a way because she gets so like violent and angry in this. Like, she just keeps on saying, I don't give a F, just kill him, and the church organ is going. And it feels like the way she's screaming could almost be a joke. I don't think it is. Uh, based on what I read, uh, it's something of a theme of hers, this sort of revenge on an abusive lover. Uh, but she has this, like, real sort of, like, power trip behind her voice. And it reminds me, um, you know, I don't go to church often, but I have gone to church a fair amount in my life. And there's some hymns... <laughs> which are just poorly put together. <laughs> They're just, they just like throw words in, you know? They just, and then the guy's going to say the next thing which they says unto the him, and then and just in jam in everywhere and just line after line after line. This feels, much of this album feels like it's trying to be religious music. This feels like one of those clumsy hymns which lends a lot to the violence and the anger of the words. Um, Glorious Father, intercede for me. I cannot hide from you, neither can he. So this idea that maybe God will avenge her, I don't know. 
Many Hands is interesting. It begins with like the sound of some bugs in the background. It's very buzzy. Lots of intentional noise here. I guess it's that avant-garde bit she was talking about. Like these untuned guitars getting blown out. And if you ever have an untuned guitar and you like really play it, it's like It makes a kind of weird sound. All these different voices happening at once. The power and the glory. Lord held me by my neck. Um, knowing that she is an academic, I wonder if she isn't just begging for somebody to write a thesis about the presence of God in this album. It is very unclear what kind of God this is. It's not a nice God. It seems to be a punishing God. It might be an avenging God. At times it seems like it's an indifferent God. Um, <laughs> Again, this is where I'm, the, the fact I do these reviews quickly and, and I, 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 try to, um, I try to have them be somewhat first reactions and not, not after sitting with them for months. I, I bet there's really something there. Another thing I'd like you to put in comments, what, how's this as a, as a simple question? Define God in this album, in the comment section. If you do, I'll give you a thumbs up at some point. Um, uh, Pennsylvania Furnace is the next song, which is very pared down, very simplistic compared to a lot of the other ones, just a piano and a sweet voice. Um, what's nice is like her voice at some point like does that little vibrato thing and then a flute comes in underneath and like keeps going and it's this nice kind of echo. Um, and then there's even some like blasted sound, like the drums almost start. There's no drums on the album, basically no drums on the album, virtually no drums on the album, but it actually sounds more like, like blasted sounds like a blasted furnace. Repent now, confess now is like this great church dirge with this banjo. It's like this sloppy and cool dirge is how I'd say it. The voice is, is operatic, acrobatic, going everywhere. Uh, quotes a lot of things from the Bible, like the body is not your home. And then again, the, the brutality and the violence of a certain form of Christian belief really comes through in this song. Confess now, confess now. Oh, he will knock the breath from you. He will ram your eyes with glass. What kind of God is this? This is the, the God that you're supposed to fear if you're a God-fearing person. The Sacred Liniment of Judgment, probably my, my least favorite song. Um, not terrible, but it's just, I, I don't know, just talking about, singing about wounds. It just gets a little too gothy for me. It's very much a drone song. It almost sounds like, I mean, like just a straight drone. Like you could play the song with, a, with an, uh, a bagpipe. My wounds that stung before now sing washed in the precious blood. Washing in the blood of Christ is definitely an image that's all the way throughout this album. Although as we will see, it is not always positive. Uh, again, the next song, The Perpetual Flame of Centralia. Centralia, I just learned about because of this album. I've watched a YouTube video about it. It's very good. It's a city. It's a town. It's a nothing. It is a nothing on a map. It is a non-town <laughs> that is in Pennsylvania. Population zero, used to have population several thousand, but there is a fire in the underground mine and the entire underground mine is on fire and the entire town is on fire. So it is a perpetual flame. And it's you know a story of corporate abuse and of uh, bad governance and of abuse of the land, but also it's just this weird fact where you can go to Centralia and just see an abandoned town. It's just piano and voice, a little bit of mandolin here. Life is a song, a song, and the fires of hell burn long and dull. Which makes these, which makes the idea of Centralia, the, the image that we have of Pennsylvania that, that she's painting. You know, she's painting this image of, of, of Pennsylvania as not really heaven or hell, but it's just a place where the, the, these great cosmic dramas can play out. The idea that Centralia that, that it's literally a representation of the flames of hell about to burn our feet. Uh, then comes Man is Like a Spring Flower, which was the stamp. And then finally, The Solitary Brethren of Ephrata, which sounds like a, I don't know, like a prog rock song, right? <laughs> the Solitary Brethren of Ephrata. Ephrata. It's not. Ephrata is another town in Pennsylvania. I looked it up. It's like a monastery. I need, to I need to release more of my own music. Anyways, uh, it's like a monastery. And what I like about this is it starts off with a quote from an anti-vaxxer at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, who says that she doesn't need to wear a mask because she's uh, covered in the blood of Jesus. 
and other people will be protected because she's covered in the blood of Jesus. I think that hints to the fact of the, the misled nature, the hurt, the abandoned, the solitary nature of the people that she is observing while she is in Walden. I mean, while she is in central Pennsylvania. This last song is so necessary. If this last song weren't there, this album would be like, good. But with this album, with this closing out the album, it makes the album great. It makes it something so much better because it's so straightforward, it's so lush, it has these wood wings, wood, wood wings, <laughs> what is this, Howard Hughes? It has woodwinds, mandolins, like very strong piano, multiple voices, paradise will be mine, voice is high and low, and at the end of mine, it's like, ah. It's just a beautifully lush, great ending to the song. It provides some kind of respite. It's a little bit further away from the unpleasant stuff. You know, it doesn't make you feel as uncomfortable, as unsettled as the rest of the album does. So there's my review. Uh, I very much recommend you spend time listening to it. You paid attention, you study it, you think about it, and then I think you will enjoy it. What does it have to do with Kanye? Okay, well there's the superficial stuff, okay? So she went to the Art Institute, uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which Kanye has spoken at, and he didn't attend it, but he once claimed in a tweet that he was going to teach a class there, okay? Also, the blood of Jesus, Wash Us in the Blood was a Kanye song from last year, a very good song, one of his best songs that is not gonna be on Donda. And this whole album is so much about Washed in the Blood of Jesus. I'd say both of these albums are very much spiritual quests to understand Jesus and the nature of Christianity, right? I mean, Kanye is a lot more sort of um, still believing while also really questioning, whereas it feels like Ligua Ignota is more like not believing but studying the negative consequences of belief. But still, I mean, we have these, I mean, fundamentally, how are they similar? They're both people who are more artists than musicians, who are more sort of cerebrally creating something at the highest level than they are making little bops for you to, you know, walking on sunshine, you know? Like you're not, neither of these albums are you singing and dancing your head to. They're supposed to make you think and, and I just, I celebrate, I celebrate them as works of vision and clarity. So there you go. Uh, if you don't know, I have a Patreon, patreon.com backslash uh, Professor Sky. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't keep the money. I take all the money and I buy music with it. So thank you to all these people. And of course, Milos, who's not on there. And uh, maybe the next review will be Kanye. Probably not. Who knows? All right. Until next time, for all the, all the people covered in Jesus' blood, there's the camera.